Hey everybody, this is Neo once again from the Overclocker magazine. Today I'm here to talk to you about the ROG Strix Z790E Gaming Wi-Fi. Now, first things first, how much is the motherboard, you may be asking? Well, it's kind of expensive. It's 500 US dollars on Amazon. Now, consider that $500 used to be what a hero motherboard used to cost a few years ago. You better be getting a lot of board for the same kind of spend. But whether you're getting that or not, I'll leave that up to you after we've gone over the features and specs and just my general experience with the motherboard and how I want to start that with you guys is just to tell you about the visuals of the motherboard. So first thing first, this is the standard black and silver design language that Asus has gone with for the previous few generations. You put that together with the brushed aluminum heat sinks that are all over the motherboard and I think this is one of the best looking boards that money can buy. And again, for $500, it better look good, you know, and fortunately this one does. However, what complements the entire look of the motherboard is actually on the north side of the motherboard near the rear I.O. There's actually the RGB section of the board and this is basically where all the RGB lighting is concentrated. Just with the lighting alone and if you look at that in combination with the color scheme of the motherboard, it just looks brilliant. So that's one part that I can definitely say is living up to the price of the motherboard. Moving on from that as well, I want to talk about power because as you know, we got to go over the power delivery and whatnot. Not in detail, but just enough for you to know what you're actually dealing with here. So this is an 18 plus one phase power design. This is not too dissimilar. In fact, it's identical to what you were getting on the Z690E. When I say identical, I'm not talking about component selection, but the fact that it is an 18 plus one configuration. But the thing that also is important for you to know is that this is an eight layer PCB board. So the whole point of using an eight layer PCB board is that you get better signaling and that involves things like your gen 5 uh, capabilities but it also or more importantly to us or at least myself it should speak directly to the DRAM OC capabilities which I'll touch on at a later point in this review. So of course you're going to get the Q code which is just a postcode LED but with that as well you get a power button and you also get the postcode lights. So these lights are obviously just a simplistic way of looking at the boot process as you know. I really didn't find that I needed to use the postcode LED. Yes I know I complain about it a lot by it being missing and so forth and of course it would kind of suck on a five hundred dollar motherboard to not have that sort of thing but the fact that it's here is appreciated even though i did not use it as much on the board itself when we're talking about just the onboard features you're going to get two usb 3.0 i know it's not usb 3.0 but let's just for the sake of it it's five gigabits per second ports right so you're going to get two of them meaning that you can actually have four outputs on your front io but in addition to that you're also going to get of course a type c header but it's not just any type c header this one is pd 3.0 compatible what does that mean to you it means that you can quick charge your tablet your phone and all sorts of things that support that sort of power spec and of course at most it can give you 30 watts of power now the last thing i want to talk about on the motherboard is the q release right it's not really a big deal but basically it just makes it easy for you to remove your graphics card the cool thing about it as well is that the actual mechanism for how this works is actually hidden under the same sort of plastics like this plastic diffuser that they were using for the rgb panel or the ignition panel on the north side of the motherboard another highlight on this motherboard is the fact that it's got five m.2 sockets of course the first one is gen 5 right you would expect that but the other two are all gen 4 and obviously one of them i think is sata mode compatible but the important thing is that the one that is gen 5 compatible it has a serious heat sink on it in fact the heat sink is just as almost as big as the other heat sink that's used for two gen 4 ssds but in addition to that it also has a lot more uh, aluminium on it so it's got a uh, raised height but it also has a heat uh, heat pipe as well so if you were dealing with a Gen 5 SSD, that's kind of hard. I think that this cooling mechanism may be able to tame the temperature. So you shouldn't have any issues with thermal throttling and so forth. But I'm not sure about that because I obviously haven't tested any Gen 5 SSDs yet. So in terms of slots, you're obviously going to get your Gen 5 X16 slot for your graphics card. That's the primary one. But in addition to that, you get two Gen 4 X4 slots, right? Now, the thing is about the last slot is that there's actually a switch just underneath it. And this is supposed to be uh, alt mode for the last PCI Express slot, of course. So there are three positions here. There's auto uh, position one and position two. So position one is basically forcing 
Gen 4 on obviously a supporting CPU. And then the last slot is to force Gen 3. Obviously the default position is auto. Why you would need this, I'm really not sure, but of course Asus felt that it was important to include this on this motherboard. So I think it's for compatibility reasons. So let's move on again to the fan headers. Of course, you're gonna get eight fan headers. I would have preferred a little bit more, again, given the kind of price that I'm paying for the motherboard. But hey, eight is more than enough. In fact, I don't have enough fans to saturate all eight that I would be using anyway. So I'm just really whining for no reason. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is the audio. The audio codec is courtesy of a familiar ALC4080, but with that, you're going to get the audio capacitors as well. You're going to get the audio routing as well, but you're also going to get the op amp. So I think this one is courtesy of Savvy Tech. So this isn't anything or a configuration you're unfamiliar with. The nice thing about it is that you are going to get a DTS unbound license or application, which adds that little bit of pop to your audio whether it's your gaming or whether it's your movies and so forth so i'm genuinely glad that they have that license here because otherwise you would have to buy it and of course all of this is controlled through sonic studio 3 which you are familiar with by now finally we get to the rear io so here you're going to get a lot of usb ports but i'll run through them with you so you know what you're dealing with here so you're going to get four five gigabits per second ports but then you're going to get seven 10 gigabits per second ports one of which is USB type C. But in addition to that, there's another type C port. This one is the full on 20 gigabits per second. Now there isn't a Thunderbolt port on the rear IO. However, there is a Thunderbolt header on the motherboard itself. So should you want to upgrade to Thunderbolt 4 USB 4, you should be able to do that. Now you're also going to get the clear CMOS button, of course, and you also get BIOS flashback. These are things that we've come to expect of every modern motherboard so at some point i think we'll just stop mentioning it but with that as well you get 2.5 g len the antennas for bluetooth 5.x i think it's 5.2 but also uh wi-fi 6e so now i finally get to talking to you about the dram compatibility on this motherboard remember i said that it was an eight layer pcb and for my purposes and most of us that should speak somewhat to the DRAM capabilities of this motherboard. Well, officially this motherboard supports DDR5 7800. And in fact, on the QVL, there are several kits that are actually rated for 7800 that seem to be working on this motherboard. Does that mean you'll be able to do DDR5 7800? Uh, I don't know. I personally was not able to do that. Yes, I was able to get into Windows, do IDA64 runs and so forth at DDR5 8000, as you can see but that was not stable. In fact, the only frequency I could get stable was DDR5 7200. And I checked online on other forums and so forth with people who are using the same motherboard and it seems as if DDR5 7200 is about the maximum you're gonna get with this board. Some people who are lucky get 7400, but I tried everything to stabilize anything 7200 plus or rather 7400 plus and it just didn't work. So I stuck with 7200. That does not mean you cannot tune this motherboard and get it to really perform really well at 7000 or 7200. And in fact, for the most part, you are better off doing 7000 that's really tuned. I'm talking your tertiaries and your secondary timings rather than having a really high speed 7600 where the timings have to be so loose that it's really not worth it. So I'm, I'm not too upset about the fact that I couldn't do super high speed. 7200 is fine for most users and even for myself. So talking further about DRAM, the one thing that I lament not being on this motherboard is DRAM profiles. Again, you're paying a lot of money for this and this by rights, I think should be here. And on top of it as well, there's another thing that's missing, which is the memory controller rating. So, you know, on the extreme, on the apex and on the hero, there's an MC rating in addition to the SP rating of the CPUs, right? But here you don't get that at all. So if you're not getting that and you're not getting the DRAM profiles, that kind of sours my experience with the board but like i said it's a very academic thing and for all intents and purposes this is an incredible board and you should be very happy with it should you get one but with that said let me know what you guys think of this motherboard so let me know what you guys in the comments below and remember share like subscribe and until then take care and peace